Here's what's ahead of us today on A Daily Walk. Opposition may very well mean you're in the will of God, not out of it. Secondly, the will of God may set you against popular opinion, not with it. These are the days in which we are living. Jesus never, I repeat, never promised his followers, then or now, that living in a fallen world would be easy or bring popularity. But sometimes, that's what we're looking for. Are you having a bad day today? Maybe things just aren't going the way you'd like to. Well, today on A Daily Walk, receive some wonderful encouragement from the scriptures. We're told in Acts 5 that the apostles were severely beaten and commanded not to speak of Jesus any longer. How did they respond to this? Well, maybe not exactly the way you'd expect. We're told they rejoiced and considered it an honor to suffer for the name of Christ. Pastor John Randall will urge us to carry this Christ-like attitude and response through life. We can and should rejoice and praise the Lord in the midst of everything we encounter. The Bible tells us when they stood trial before the Sanhedrin in verse 28, the council said, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now for a second time, the apostles were questioned and it was reiterated by the court what had been said before. They had been clearly instructed not to preach, notice what they said, in this name. They couldn't even bring themselves to say the name Jesus. They said in this name, that man's blood. They couldn't even say his name. And one of the charges that they brought against the apostles was this, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. What an amazing indictment that served as a testament to the effectiveness of the ministry of the apostles in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Their community was impacted by the message of Jesus Christ. Would to God that our communities would be impacted with the truth of Jesus Christ and that thousands in these days would repent of sin and turn to Christ for salvation. Listen, it's not enough to know about Jesus. You must know him personally. You must believe in the name of Jesus if you're going to be saved from hell and on your way to heaven. But how would Peter respond to this accusation concerning his violation of the orders of the governing officials. This was clear civil disobedience on the part of Peter. I want you to note Peter's response here, friend, in verse 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. That's our response. Peter responded with the same response that every single Christian should respond with. That is when man's law is in conflict with God's law, then we must obey God rather than man. The words of the apostles were in essence the same words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they stood before the fiery furnace. Their response was reminiscent to that of Daniel when he was told he could no longer pray to God. Instead, he opened up his windows and he got on his knees and he prayed as he had always done. You see, there was a higher court in Israel than the Sanhedrin. There was the Supreme Court of Heaven and the Sanhedrin had no authority to forbid them to preach in the name of Jesus. They knew it, the apostles knew it, and it was simply a question of loyalty. Folks, today there is even a higher court than the Supreme Court of the United States. It's God's throne where he is the Lord and judge over all the earth and every judge and every governing official, every political leader and every person will stand one day before God and give an account of the life that they have lived. 
There's a higher court. And Peter, in that moment, he turned the tables in the courtroom. He and the other apostles were the ones who were standing trial, being indicted by the council. But instead, Peter actually accused his accusers, citing that they themselves were guilty of murdering the Son of God when they placed him on a cross. Peter said, God sent his son into the world and you killed him. Yet even though they had put him to death on the cross, Jesus was alive and risen from the dead. And the apostles were sent into the world now to preach the message of the resurrected Savior. Peter's message on that day when he stood trial was bold because it confronted the religious leaders with their sin. It was powerful in that it exalted the name of Jesus. And it was hopeful as he pointed out that regardless of the sins that had been committed, they could get right with God by repenting of sin. And if they obeyed, they could receive the Holy Spirit. For a second time, Peter, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and with all boldness, made a stand for the gospel. When the Sanhedrin heard these words, they went from being jealous to now murderous. They were determined to put the apostles to death. But before the verdict was handed down, before the death sentence could be passed, they met together and they were given some words of wisdom from one of their well-known colleagues whose name was Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was an authoritative teacher of the law, a valued opinion he offered It was said that he was the grandson of Hillel, who was the most influential teacher of the liberal wing of the Pharisees. He was actually the one who instructed Saul of Tarsus before he became Paul the apostle. He was well known. And he gave them some words of wisdom. And I want you to see this. And he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him, and he was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. Verse 37. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census. He drew many people away after him, but he also perished, and those who obeyed him, they were dispersed. Verse 38. And now I say to you, keep away from these men. Let them alone. For if this plan or if this work is of men, it'll come to nothing. But if it's of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Gamaliel, well known for being full of wisdom, cited two previous cases that had come up in the past that he felt set a precedent because they were very similar to the one they were facing at that moment. He said, you remember Thutis? Remember how he he thought he was the Messiah and he had all those people follow him and then he died and then everybody scattered. It's no big deal. And there was also that one of the guy, what was his name? Oh, Judas of Galilee. Remember, he did the exact same thing and all his people were scattered when he perished. Judas was killed, his followers were scattered. Judas was killed, and his following no longer exists. And Gamaliel assumed, listen, that Jesus was like any other person. Gamaliel encouraged his fellow Pharisees to leave the apostles alone. He felt that their following would suffer the same fate of all the other groups that had faded away in time. If what they were doing was simply a passing trend, it would eventually come to nothing. So in essence, he said, listen, don't even worry about it. On the other hand, he said, if what they're preaching was real and Jesus is who they said he was, then to oppose them, they'd be in danger of fighting against God. Listen, folks, the counsel of Gamaliel was both true and false. It was true that what is from God cannot be overthrown. That was true. It was also true that it's foolish to try and use physical means to overthrow spiritual forces. But it was not true that everything of human origin is soon overthrown and its followers scattered. And it is also untrue to put Jesus on the same level as any self-proclaimed Messiah. As Gamaliel drew his conclusion about Jesus, He failed to acknowledge or recognize the difference between Jesus and the others who were mentioned. You see, what set Jesus apart was that Jesus was alive and no longer dead. That's the difference. 
Jesus is alive. That's what sets him apart from every other religious leader who's ever come in their own name. He's alive. Friend, I've said it many times before. If Jesus is not alive, then us being here today is pointless. There's no reason to push back. There's no reason to stand. There's no reason for any church to meet. There's no reason to want to worship and lift your voice and sing. You can listen to the mandate. You can do all of that if he's not alive. But if he is alive, then we do gather, we do assemble, and we do praise him because of who he is. He's a resurrected king, friends. There are those today that assume that Christianity isn't any different from any other belief system. They say, well, all religions basically believe the same thing. They just have different names for the God of their choice. Nothing could be further from the truth. They do not all believe the same thing and they do not all end up in the same place. But those same people who make those statements fail to consider, again, that Jesus is not like any other man. Jesus alone came and died on the cross for the sins of the world, And Jesus alone conquered sin and death by rising from the dead. Therefore, Jesus is set apart from any other person who has come and gone from the pages of history. And here we are today, folks, some 2,000 years later, still testifying of what the apostles preached back then, that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be, that he is crucified, risen, and now the glorified savior of the world, and that salvation is found in no other name except the name of Jesus. We are still proclaiming that message right now today. Well, when the court reconvened, the apostles were brought back to stand before their accusers, and something happened in verse 40. Please look at your Bible and notice what it says. It says, and when they had beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The council decided to let them go, but they wouldn't let them go without giving them something to remember. If they ever failed to comply with their commands again, so they beat them. And when it says that they beat them, It's a word that meant they flogged them with whips that took the skin off their back. According to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, they would be whipped 39 times. It was as if they beat them within an inch of their life. Imagine the apostles standing there side by side, hearing the sound of the whip across their backs and the pain and the blood because they testified that Jesus was alive. And it was the truth. At any point, when they got the whips out, the apostles could have said, hey, wait a second. Hey, whoa, hey, oh, hold the whips. It's cool, it's cool. Hey, listen, John, tell them where we put the body. Tell them, tell them it's not true. Tell them it really didn't happen. He's not really resurrected. Let's be, let's be sensible here. Nobody has to get beaten today. But it was all true. I imagine the religious leaders and the political leaders thought, well, That'll be the last we hear from these apostles. They'll think twice. They'll remember the scars they received before they open their mouths again and preach in the name of Jesus. That's the end of that, they thought. But look at the very next verse, friends. It says here, so they departed from the presence of the council. Might want to underline this. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Hallelujah, what a testimony. The Bible doesn't say they left the council crying or complaining. They didn't leave fearful or regretful. It says they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. Why? Because years earlier, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to his disciples, and I'm sure the first time they heard this, they thought, that's a little crazy. 
But in Matthew chapter five, verses 10 and 11, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice, Jesus said, be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How can you be blessed or happy when you're persecuted? What kind of joy is this? that counts it a privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is, they experienced it. And rather than deter them or stop them from preaching, it only increased their desire to be that much more bold for Jesus. Friend, let me ask you a question. What's it gonna take to stop you from preaching the gospel? What has to happen before you just stop talking about Jesus? Is there anything? For the apostles, it was only death itself. They went out rejoicing. They boldly defied the orders of the Sanhedrin. They paid no attention to their threats. But this was the last time that the ministry in the temple was mentioned. It was now time for the church to branch out, to go in every direction, even outside of Jerusalem and fulfill this great commission. This was a pivotal moment in the ministry of the church. 12 men came out of their persecution bearing the scars of injustice and they were rejoicing. Understand something today, church. Opposition may very well mean you're in the will of God, not out of it. Secondly, the will of God may set you against popular opinion, not with it. These are the days in which we are living. Jesus never, I repeat, never promised his followers then or now that living in a fallen world would be easy or bring popularity. But sometimes that's what we're looking for. I just want to be liked. I don't want to be hated. I don't want to experience any persecution. But Jesus said this in Luke 6, 26, woe to you when all men speak well of you for so they spoke concerning the false prophets. Jesus also said in John 15, if the world hates you, know this, it hated me before it hated you. If you were, listen, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember, Jesus said, the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep your word also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake. Why? Because they do not know him who sent me. Folks, I'm sharing this with you and I'm saying it to myself. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if things don't get easier, but they get more difficult. Don't be surprised. The Lord said something to Jeremiah and the Lord reminded me of it this week. Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah was struggling in the ministry. The entire culture that he was sent to preach rejected him. They called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. I think he had one convert after 40 years of ministry. I would weep too. But there came a point when Jeremiah He just was struggling with the whole thing. The whole thing, I'm just tired of it. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of being opposed. I don't like the way it's going. I'm feeling the encroachment of darkness. I'm done with it. And this was God's response to Jeremiah. And I believe this is a response to us as the church today. Listen carefully, Jeremiah chapter 12, verse five. The Lord said to Jeremiah, his prophet, if if you've run with the footmen and they've wearied you, then how can you contend with the horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted they wearied you, how are you going to do in the floodplain of the Jordan? In other words, the Lord said to his prophet who was standing for righteousness and standing for truth, hey, Jeremiah, the horses are coming. Right now it's the footmen. And you're saying, 
I can't do this anymore. I don't want, I'm, I'm finished. The Lord said, if you're tired with the footman, what are you going to do when the horses are coming? Because I hear the sound of the hooves of the horsemen. It's not going to get easier. When you see things like the Supreme Court of the United States ruling in favor of casinos over the church gathering, it's not going to get easier. When you see riots and protests being applauded and supported, and yet the church being told, don't sing, don't gather. I mean, it's just, you understand this. We're all aware of this fact. It's not going to get easier. But we have a responsibility. And it's the same responsibility that the apostles had back then. And that is this. Every day in the temple, from house to house, we keep right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. We don't stop. We don't stop. We're in a spiritual battle. There are those who sadly would say, oh, this isn't a spiritual battle. This isn't that. This is not, the government isn't over. It's not that. Well, I would say to those people, they don't get it. (laughs) They just don't get it. It's probably because they're not really in the battle. They don't understand. But you are, and I am. And guys, we stand together in Jesus. We're living for a completely different kingdom. (laughs) It's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of this world is going to pass away, but one day there's a kingdom coming, the kingdom of God, where Jesus is going to rule and reign. That's the hope. That's the future. When God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus is coming soon. Folks, listen, this is the time as the second wave comes and the third wave comes and whatever else comes. By God's grace, through the power of his Holy Spirit, we have to remain bold. We have to keep moving forward. I'm not inciting civil disobedience. I'm inciting or encouraging, rather, us to be obedient to God above everyone else. Amen? And may God help us to do just that. That is Pastor John Randall, and this is A Daily Walk. What you heard today is part of our Through the Bible study. To hear this message again, you can do so by podcast at adailywalk.org or wherever you like to listen to your favorite podcasts or request a CD copy for a cost of just $5. Here's our toll-free number to do that, 877-242-0828. That's 877-242-0828. This month, we picked out a book for moms. It's the 20 Hardest Questions Every Mom Faces praying your way to realistic biblical answers. Dana Gresh points out that motherhood is filled with uncertainty and difficult questions, and there is not one right answer despite what the mommy words tell you. You need a coach, someone to come alongside of you. Dana helps you arrive at some answers to some of the toughest questions you face as a mom. It's yours for the special price of $9 at adailywalk.org or call us at 877 242-0828. And please remember that your gifts help us to bring these shows to the radio and the internet every day. We can't do it alone. So please consider standing with us to get the good news of Jesus Christ out over the airwaves. Again, visit us at adailywalk.org or call 877-242-0828. It brightens our day when we hear of the good things God is doing in our listeners' lives through the teaching of the Word. Share your story today by email at adailywalk at gmail.com. Pastor John loves to read these emails, so please keep them coming. That's adailywalk at gmail.com. Here to close things out in prayer is Pastor John once again. Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning for your Word. It's amazing to me, Lord, how you knew we would be in the book of Acts and you knew what chapter we'd be in today, this week. And Lord, it seems as though we're, we're tracking right along with everything that's happening in this world. Lord, we pray that the message of the gospel would continue to go forth. Lord, we pray for these areas in our country where violence is prevailing. God, we pray, Lord, that you would put the violence down 
that you bring light into those dark places, God. That people would be saved, God. Lord, help us not to be afraid. Help us not to be discouraged. Lord, help us to realize that these are some of the most exciting times to be a Christian. Lord, things are happening. You are moving, Lord. So Lord, give us strength. Give us power of the Holy Spirit no matter what comes next. Lord, we're not, as I've said before, not trying to be rebels, God. We're just trying to be Christians. We just want to be followers of Jesus. And Lord, there's a cost to taking up the cross and following you. Lord, help us to count that cost and to follow after Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're learning how to solve problems in the church next time on A Daily Walk with John Randall. See you tomorrow. This is a presentation of Calvary South O.C., 